Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 90, free D6, free tabletop games that use standard dice. From ha a mountain in Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from the bottom of Canada, the Tabletop <laughs> Bellhop himself, Moti. Why didn't you hurt Canada stops at London? That's what I've been told by a couple companies who refuse to deliver to my house because I'm not in southwestern Ontario. But anyway, I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right. In addition to our main topic of D6 games, we've got more than the usual amount of viewer reader feedback in our suggestion box segment. I've got a review of Clans of Caledonia for our game room segment and a pretty light week in review, including my first thoughts on eminent domain exotica and a couple plays of woodlands. And that'll be in our bell hops tabletop segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit me up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, some positive feedback from our list of free games to keep you busy while stuck at home. Carry the Slip writes, wow, that is a fantastic listing of all the free games. Thank you so much for posting. I'll definitely be playing a few of these. Awesome. Thank you. And sorry, you're welcome, Kerry. Uh, I'd love to know how your plays go because I, I haven't, we haven't taken the time to download any of them, but man, there's a lot of stuff on that list. I would love to know how it works out if you try any of these. Well, Mike Robinson writes, this is an amazing list. Thank you. I obsessively collect print and play <laughs> games. This is like crack for me. Well, glad we could feed your healthy obsession there, Mike. <laughs> Carcassonne Central says, great list. Thanks for collating. You're most welcome, Carcassonne Central. Chris Groff commented, ha, very cool. I had no idea major vendors were releasing so many print-and-play games. Well, thanks for the comment, Chris. Now, I do have to say, it has been really awesome to see this outpouring of support from the tabletop gaming industry. Now, I know they probably won't hear it, but I do want to thank every designer and publisher who has gone out of their way to do something, anything really, to support gamers in this most interesting of times. Now, jumping back to you, our comparison of the three best sites for gaming online, Susan Robertson writes, good resource. I decided to become a premium member of Board Game Arena because it's really not a lot of money for a year, and only one person <laughs> needs to be premium member to access some of the better games on the site. There are also a lot of games I've <laughs> never heard of and may never play, but the ones they do have I like, like Seven Wonders, Terra Mystica, and King Domino. Well, thanks for the comments, Susan. I gotta say, those are three of our favorite games on the site, ones we play regularly. I can't remember the last time I didn't have a Seven Wonders game going. Has been a bit since we played King Domino, but we actually live-streamed a play of that. Uh, every now and then, though, what I like to do is try something new and, and add it to the rotation. Something... And everything we've added, I've never been disappointed. We tried uh, Takenoko. Uh, we tried Through the Ages is one we've been playing quite a bit. Actually, we haven't had a game in a while. We need to start up another one of those, just between the three of us. Indeed, that last game went poorly for three of us after some random stranger who was really good at the game got added in. Well, now that we have uploaded a bunch of our video content to board games, mm -hmm. we're starting to get a few comments over there, which is great to Sweet. see. Brian Fisher commented on our Sorcerer actual play to say, I really like this game. Oh, thanks for your comment, Brian. Now, this isn't the kind of comment I'd normally throw in our show notes. Like, it's good to hear it. And I'm glad that Brian commented, but I just found this one so ironic that I had to bring it up because it's a comment on the actual play of Sorcerer that was three players where we actually had a miserable time because Sean was down from Hamilton. And I got to say, the game didn't go well. Then that's being polite. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't have an actual play because I was bad play because I was down from Hamilton. No, but no. Because I was down from Hamilton, it was three player and, and not yeah. how that game should play. Well, now some comments on our best six player games topic from two 
go. Isaac Kuo writes, I don't know about best six player games. My favorite games are best played with six players. <laughs> like TI third edition, Dune, Illuminati, Wiz War. I like a house rule which connects up to six boards as a cube. The thing well, is, I can never get that many players together. Oh, thanks for the comic, Isaac. Uh, Twilight Imperium and Dune, those were on our list. I, I couldn't help that one. Uh, Red Meeple Ryan from our chat room did call out Illuminati as a great option, so we got that one covered. Now, Wiz War, that is a game I have been curious about for years. Like, this is a game that came out in the 70s. It's, like, as old as um, Cosmic Encounter and um, oh, Merchant of Venus, right? Like, old Avalon Hill game that keeps being reprinted and supposedly improved on every new edition that comes out. And it's still popular today. You can still get printings. I, I want to try that game sometime. It's supposed to be like a real, everything in the game's overpowered, so it works. But like you just read your powers and you're like, this is nuts. Oh, that's nuts. Oh my God, that's nuts. But it somehow works. It sounds really neat. Now, I got to say, I can't really help you much with the problem of getting six or more people together, especially not right now. Uh, as usual, though, we will toss Isaac's recommendations in the show notes and good luck finding a group, hopefully when all this mess clears up or at least playing online. Well, Phil Hatfield has some more six-player game recommendations. Another light, good game for a wide range of age groups, is Happy Salmon. And I don't know if I would count Eclipse as shorter than TI4. I have mm -hmm. seen six-player games of Eclipse last nine hours or more. At lower player counts, it can be faster. But when you have six players, it will likely be just as long as a TI4 or even TI3 game. And the new love letter also plays up to six now. Well, thanks for the comment, Phil. Uh, Happy Salmon. I admit, I, I did try it. I finally played it. It was at a party. It was a, a misdirected Mark uh, Queen City Conquest pre-con party. I, I don't know. I don't get that game. Like, I maybe if we played it at the end of the night instead of the beginning of the night when I had a few more pops, I might have enjoyed it a bit more. It, it's just too chaotic for me. I know some people will love it, but that's probably not going to end up on any of my game recommendation lists unless it's like games to play when you're stupid drunk or something like that. Now, as for Eclipse, I don't know. I Phil may have more experience than me, but I have yet to see a game of Eclipse go as long as a game of Twilight Imperium with the same player count. Like, I can see a three- to four-player game of Twilight Imperium finishing before, say, a six-player game of Eclipse. But if you had six-player games of each going at the same time, I, I don't know. Like, I, I guess it's going to matter depending on the people and how much they know the rules. But I think with the average group, it, it's going to be uh, definitely quicker on Eclipse. And Board Game Geek seems to indicate this as well, looking at the times. But I don't know. Like, I, I, I'm sure Phil's seen it. I'm not trying to say Phil's full of bs here but it's definitely i've in, in my experience eclipse has always been the quicker game at the same player count now love letter that's going to be a quick game that is a lightning quick game i gotta say a solid recommendation for more many groups uh probably would have been a good recommendation for chris marintet who we were replying to with this list of games a good one for non-gamers i gotta admit i'm personally not a big fan but you know what uh, enough people like it it's popular enough and of course we'll throw these in the show notes as well well, I want a final list of six-player games recommendations, this time from Neil Helmer. Feudum, Struggles of Empires, Princes of the Renaissance, Eclipse, and Caverna. Well, thanks for the list, Neil. Uh, we do overlap on a couple of those. Uh, those were, a couple of those were on our list. I'm sure people can tell from that list, Neil is definitely into heavier games, uh, meatier games. Uh, he owes me a game of Feudum. He's been promising me that since Extra Life, actually. We were talking about in the pre-show. Uh, at that event, he set up a big game of it. And I got to say, a game looks fascinating. Um, I, I need to try it before I throw that on my list. The other ones, I don't know, Struggle Empires is solid with the right group. It's, it's just... You, Chris didn't seem like the kind of gamer that I would think would like many of these. Caverna and Eclipse are are getting close, but yeah, they're definitely um, more confrontation-focused games, and some groups are definitely into that. All right, well, we'll toss those in our notes. Up next, we have John James, who commented on our Fox in the Forest duet review from okay. last week. John writes, I picked up this game because my wife is so competitive while playing board games. I wanted a change of scenery. <laughs> Uh, totally fair. Thanks for commenting, John. Uh, I hope this gives you a much needed break. I totally understand the potential stress of playing with a very competitive partner. Next, we'll jump to an older topic of where to find out of print games. Bill writes, 
Though I have never had any luck on this myself, I have seen several people on MiWi and previously on Google Plus who posted about finding great games at their local Goodwill or secondhand store. Usually those places don't realize the rarity or the demand for the board games, mm -hmm. so people tend to find them for a, just a couple of bucks at most. Some I have even seen got real gems of games for less than a buck. Again, I have not had any luck in my area, but in places with more people, I think more people, family members, take old games they don't play anymore or games from someone who passed away to the Goodwill or secondhand store. I've seen photos of old war games, newer games from the last seven years or so, and extremely rare games from decades past. So checking at those places is another potential spot to find older, out-of-print games. Uh, thanks for the comment, Phil. I, I agree. It's, it's a fair point. Now, I did consider putting resale shops, thrift stores uh, on that list of things. The problem is it's hit or miss. Like, it's random. Whenever, like whenever we're on vacation, wherever we go to town, if we go to London, we go to we go to Quebec, we go anywhere. Deanna and I like to hit up places like Goodwill or Value Village, and we've been doing this for over thirty years. Like it, this is back when we used to take the bus in our teens to London, and like once out of all that time, I found a copy of Marvel Heroes Escape for three bucks. That's it in thirty years. Like that's how how bad the chances are. Now I gotta admit, some people online seem to have really good luck, or maybe they're really good with Photoshop. Sometimes I do wonder at the number of people who've happened to find copies of three hundred dollar games at Goodwills. But regardless, the thing is, I wouldn't go to a thrift store to find a specific game. Like if if I was looking for, I remember the question originally, someone was looking for Mississippi Queen. I wouldn't go to thrift stores looking for Mississippi Queen. Now I'll still go to thrift stores, and there's always a chance I'll find something cool or out of print. But it's always the surprise. It's always the oh cool, I found this neat out of print game. I'm gonna pick that up. I like that's what it's random, right? I, I wouldn't go shopping for them. Now, what you might want to do is if you're really looking for something is maybe pick up the phone or email. I, I don't know if these places have email places, but like I wouldn't go driving to every value village, but maybe call a bunch of Goodwills and say, hey, do you happen to have this game? But overall, like compared to the other sources, they're, they're like almost definitely, we found places that had Mississippi Queen. Whereas I would almost guarantee you there's nowhere in Southwestern Ontario that at a Goodwill or whatever that's going to have that game. But there's always a chance. Yeah, I, to me, uh, whenever you're doing uh, either resale or yard sailing, that is something that you do as a regular habit, and you're gonna get lucky eventually. Great, you got your yeah. Marvel, you got your Marvel Champions. That was your lucky hit. Uh, but a lo lot of the people who do that are sort of weekly. You know, every week you go to mm -hmm. three Goodwill shops and every yard sale you can find, and when you start upping the odds like that you know if you flip a coin a thousand times eventually you're going to get you know 20 ones in a row or 20 heads in a row yeah. fair enough now finally some encouragement from fans on hitting our 10,000th podcast download doug sartori says hey that's awesome <laughs> brian p kurtz writes i love what you all do with the hospital as crazy it has been and i understand you there brian mm -hmm. i just haven't been able to catch the stream but I love sure. listening to the episodes and after re and reading the write-ups on the site. Thanks, O'Shawn and Deanna. And Al Jam comments, most people do giveaways, you know. <laughs> well, thanks for the encouragement, folks. Uh, Al, we have done giveaways with mixed results, unfortunately. Uh, they haven't really drummed up the the... The, the links and hits we were hoping for. And to be honest, right now, I still have two copies of Medium. Uh, Danielle's in our chat. Literally, I went to our local post office. Like, I'm sure there is a post office in the city that will do it, but I went to our local post office, the closest one, with two packages. Like, we're sorry, we can't ship this. Are you commercial? And I'm like, no. They're like, is this uh, emergency? I'm like, no. And they're like, no, I'm sorry. We're not doing non-essential package shipping um, internationally and sorry us is international to canada despite how close we may be so i wasn't able to ship them so i still have the giveaways from our last giveaway that i can't send out like yes i could probably go downtown to the post office and do it but it, thankfully both people who have won um aaron and danielle have been very cool about waiting till things die down so we can get them out there i do would like to do uh, more giveaways once things look to normal. Uh, I would have loved to have celebrated the 10,000 somehow, but it just, with everything going on right now, what, what kind of party? Like, I would have done a ramen party like we did for our launch party if I didn't have some people over gaming and maybe give something away. But we're not opposed to giveaways, so just with things the way they're going right now, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week's comments and suggestions. Thanks you, everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content.
A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so now's the time to make sure you've checked out all our formats. Podcast, YouTube, the website, Facebook, Twitter, even Board Game Geek. We are spreading everywhere. We're, uh, I, I, no, I'm not going to bother. <laughs> <laughs> There's like way too many social media sites that I own an account on and I get admit them back because I don't ever, I just jump in and drop our latest episodes. There's a bunch of those. If, if it's out there, we're, we're there. Instagram's worth mentioning. Instagram, I post at least once a day. That one gets some good interaction. We got a lot of followers there. So we are on the grams or whatever kids are calling it these days. All right, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. I say this every week, but I'm going to keep putting it out there because I send out an email that recaps everything we put out. Uh, we do put out quite a bit of different content. We got blog posts. We got podcast episodes. We got unboxings. Sometimes we even have actual plays. This gives you links to everything all in one place so it's easy to find. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, I'm not going to bring this up every week because it just get a little repetitive and I think most people know about it already, but because we've entered into April and it's another month of us, many of us being stuck at home, not everyone anymore, but many of us, I just want to remind people to check out our list of free print and play games and modules. Uh, these are ones that have been released by awesome publishers and designers to give us something to do while stuck at home. And there were a whole bunch that ended at the end of May, like they did it for the month of May, while a whole bunch of new people have stepped up to fill the gap for April. So even if you checked out the list before, I think it's worth checking out again especially because we're actually in may now and things ended in april and started again in may not yeah. the other way around you can find this list by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on 200 plus free pmp games at the top of the page or follow the link that i just dropped in the chat room and it'll be in our show notes as well time travel optional Well, we start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. ish Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around, and we continue the show after the double bell with more ch cut chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons get, including a chance to win something tonight. Yeah, tonight at the end of the game. So we were talking about this wasn't in the announcement section because I had kind of, there was a miscommunication, we'll just say. Nothing bad. Uh, Worldwide Play Day. We talked about Renegade Games is doing this Worldwide Play Day thing. So today's featured game was Fuse. Now they changed the format a, a bit. So what they had people do was they had two featured streamers that they played the game and anyone who watched them during the chat, they had these goals to hit while they were playing. And if they hit the goals, they would draw a name from everyone who was in chat at the time, which I thought was really cool. Um, but it's, they're not trying to get everyone to play at the same time now, like they were before. It's more watch these people play and see how they do and interact with them, which I think kind of makes sense because it, it directs the focus instead of just spreading everyone. Some people are watching us, some people are watching Terry, some people are watching this. Now you have one feed to watch, which kind of, in a marketing perspective, to me that makes a little more sense for Renegade's sake. But they all still encourage people to play and play the game and take pictures of playing and use the hashtag and enter for chances to win. So what I'm going to do during the after show tonight, because we always do random things during the after show, I'm going to play a solo game of Fuse. Possibly two. I don't know. It's a 10 minute game, so it doesn't take long. Literally, you only have 10 minutes on timer. And I'm going to try to hit as many of the uh, challenges they put forward today. So instead of worldwide events, they had these challenges. It was like, do these things and you unlock stuff, which was giveaways for people. And everyone who sticks around and says something in the chat, so we got to get your name on our chat room, which should be easy enough to do, we'll get entered in the draw. I'm gonna give them over to Renegade Games, I'm gonna give them to uh, that Terry girl, Terry Latorco, as soon as the stream's done, and you'll get entered in a worldwide draw to win a prize pack from the designer of Fuse. It's, I think it's three or four of his games. You'll have to stick around to actually find out what that is. And for all you who are listening to this, this is what you miss out on by not joining us on Wednesdays. Absolutely. Well, in the chat room today, we've had a little bit of chat about, uh, Stuff uh, we were talking about, uh, like uh, finding stuff at secondhand stores. Yep. Uh, Danielle's mentioning that there's thrift stores you can't thrift stores you can't find much other than VHS games yep. and Kala or mass produced stuff, which is uh, very common, oh, yeah. of course. Uh, games of Monopoly, the Game of mm -hmm. Life, stuff like that are, are probably regular. all incomplete too. I've noticed. Yeah, uh, more than likely, you know, when you. You're 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 missing seven hundred dollars of Monopoly money, and uh, no one knows. And you've got the houses from three different <laughs> sets. Yeah. 
Well, there there were some I can't remember. There's a Harry Potter trivia game. There were some that like we haven't we haven't done thrifting in a while, but when we were doing it, Atmosphere was another. But that one was actually worth some money. One of the older VHS games. But like there were certain games you would see everywhere. Yeah. And trivia's were the biggest. Like whatever trivia. Yeah. At like at whatever popular TV show, Friends trivia, Scrubs trivia, whatever the heck it was. There were always so many. Danielle mentioned. Now, I noticed- Danielle mentioned the exact same thing because those are one of those things that people get given and you might you're play a fan them, of this show you might play them once and realize they're a bad game or go through all the questions and well you're never going to want to play it again so off it goes <laughs> now I know she's found a copy of the Lone Wolf and Cub game that is another game that I reviewed as positively as I reviewed Masters of the Universe because <laughs> it was published by Mayfair Games, came out in the 80s. I bought it because I really liked Sanctuary, which was also published by Mayfair. And at the time, I bought boxes based on companies, which actually I still kind of do, which is interesting. So if it's a Games Workshop, I bought it. And like literally, I bought it. I think I own everything they put out in the early or late 80s, early 90s. Mayfair Games was another one. If they stood up like a bookshelf, like a book. Now, other Mayfair Games I didn't have to have, but the bookshelf style games I always bought. So one of the ones I bought was Lone Wolf and Cub. Well, the problem is the game was unplayable to the fact that I totally forgot that I had this unplayable game until I was writing a blog post on the WGR or something and someone brought it up. And I'm like, holy cow, I can fix it because the reason that it was unplayable is the rule book was printed wrong and it's missing two pages and they're the pages for character creation. So there was no way to make your character to go on this like random move around the map and and do neat stuff like the game sounded cool and i'm sure you could like kind of make it up and kind of guess like oh you had to roll a die and add your strength and you need difficulty five you could be like oh my strength's probably two like you could have you could kind of make it up but i was so frustrated that like this obvious printing error and leisure world where i bought it from wouldn't take it back because it was opened because leisure world was actually not very nice to gamers they wanted to sell you trains and bottle (laughs) kits yeah they happened to have a gaming section but they they didn't care for gamers especially young gamers So I never got to play it. So what's cool is Board Game Geek has a complete rule book that explains like the, a, a PDF of, of the mission sheets. But since then, I sold that game. It's it's one of the few games from my childhood that I got rid of because it was completely unplayable. Right. Uh, and Danielle's pointing out that uh, Trivial Pursuit, especially, uh, it ages and it ages badly. Yes. Uh, geography sections are, are not the wrong. same as they once were. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you could be brilliant at modern literature and entertainment but not know the best movies of the 80s, which, yeah. you know, are featured in that Trivial Pursuit game you picked up. Plus stuff that's changed. Like some things have literally, they've determined, you know, yep. science has, has progressed <laughs> yep. and disproved things. Like you get the question about Pluto and you're like, huh, is it a, name all it the pla- planet? Yeah, name all the not? planets. Oh, when did this game come out? Yeah, when like, did this game come out? That's the one where I give them a bonus. I'm like, if you can name all of them, including or not, <laughs> you, you get the point, you get yeah, the pie. Yeah. I don't know. We we have found RPG books. RPG books are a little more common, especially D and D books. Right. I don't know how many copies I found, like old AD and D books and stuff like that. Well, especially and then, I mean, the, you, once you're on to fourth ed, do you really need the second ed books anymore? Uh, some people think so, but well, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> actually, I see a lot more fourth ed books for sale because well, people there's that, just yes. like that particular edition. I was it's I mean, not I collectible. Wasn't... That's a difference too, though. Is is the second ed in earlier books are collectible items to many people if they're in good shape. I don't think the fourth ed stuff's ever going to end up being worth money. The, we've had better luck at yard sales. We've hit a couple good yard sales. Like someone was um, a, a artist from Magic the Gathering and was selling off their game collection, and they had collectible cards and RPG books and stuff. I happened to not be there that day. Deanna was. And I'm like, oh, I wish I'd been there. But again, I still – I wouldn't go – I'm looking for a copy of this and then no, expect no, no. to find it, right? No, to me, again, that's it's, the it's random... very much like yard selling, right? You're yeah. out there to find things. Yes. You know, things in, in quotation marks with an underline. You don't know what those things are. You're just hoping that something will emerge, whether it's that, you know, that toy that the person doesn't know is worth $300 or yes. that game that you've been hunting for that you can never find anywhere. Those are the things you're hunting for. And, and yeah. no, you can't go and I, well, today I'm shopping for a copy of no. No, uh, exactly. Right. Like that. Then that's why it wasn't in the, in the blog post. I honestly don't remember our podcast version. I, I think we did talk about 
like yeah. yard sailing and that yeah, yeah, on yeah. the podcast episode i just didn't throw it in as a recommendation yeah no it's it's one of those things that yeah you it's it's something to do but it's something to do not specifically for anything yep uh mitch gale is saying uh, most geeks now pre-advertise their yard sales to other geeks see i would never uh, yeah. trust a geek's yard sale because they know what the stuff is worth yeah I, and I, if i'm going to a yard In sale general. i want to find a deal not not find uh you know some geek who knows what this is worth and is going to charge me that for it <laughs> what we've always done now is we have a table right. so you have the yard sale but then you have the table of collectibles right so this the stuff and like you tell people that right yeah, yeah. but what i do find that like it happens what i see happening more often with geeks is they sell the stuff before the yard sale right. they go on to facebook groups or whatever and are like i'm gonna put this stuff in a yard sales anyone on it before it gets there yeah that's what i tend to see a lot of um in a way, almost replaced yard sales for most geeky items, as far as I can tell. Because there's four different groups just in Windsor, like on Facebook, four different groups I can list my board games for sale. One I run, right. but there are three others I can easily put in. Hey, I have these games for sale. So, well, and I think I know I know in the states it's a bigger thing. I don't know about Canada, but free cycling became a pretty big thing at one point for you know shifting your stuff around and not having yeah. yard sales at all. You would just do the whole free cycling thing through in your through, without your community. Uh, and, you know, if you didn't need something, someone else in your community did, and it just passed around that way, yeah. and you didn't have to worry about the yard sales. I haven't seen that for gaming, but I do see an awful lot of buy-sell groups that are more trade groups, where people aren't doing doing um, money, right? Like, it's, right. I've got this, I've got that, do you have any of this? I especially see that the war gaming community, miniature war gaming. Right. I see that a ton. Now, I'm in a bunch of the groups. I don't play any of the games anymore, but like the War Machine groups, the Star Wars Legion groups, the X-Wing groups, I see an awful lot of, hey, I was playing Troll Bloods. I don't want to play Troll Bloods anymore. Does anyone have a Menoth army? I'll trade you my Troll Bloods for your Menoth. And right. I see an awful lot of that going around. And same with X-Wing, right? Like I've got old X-Wing 1.0 ships. I don't want to play 2.0. Do you have any Star Wars Legion stuff we could trade? That, that definitely seems to happen. Yeah. With, like I said, it seems to be very little money exchanging hands. It seems more like people pass around their stuff yeah it's, it's actually interesting i know uh the small business community in hamilton in my area uh there's been a real big push at a new barter economy pro you know post covid because yeah. people have you know been forced to shut down a lot of times with stock uh mm -hmm. some of that stock may be perishable some may not um you know but you can't move it through the normal channels so there's been a whole lot of barter talk going on within the the oh, business community of hamilton um just because i follow some of the uh the local city uh twitter accounts where they've been talking quite a bit about it i, I don't know how many people have been biting but they've been they've been working pretty hard to to try oh, and cool. encourage this barter economy i haven't seen it myself but i'm sure it's happening um, all righty We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media always works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they get tracked and logged and all that happy stuff so they don't vanish and you don't forget about them in your stream of Twitter flying by. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, today we've got a question from Jeff who writes... What are some good, free, printable D6 games for Family Night? Okay. One autistic, one, AD, one ADHD, we play games like Yahtzee and Farkle, but would like and are willing to expand into the RPG universe or multiverse. Interesting. <laughs> multiverse. Well, thank you very much for the question, Jeff. Um, while we did get this question before the current worldwide mess i thought this would be a good time to bring this one up it seems particularly timely right now so this was in our question pile it's, a, it's an older question from jeff i don't know jeff's last name they didn't leave it it's not jeff seuss who i thought it might be at the time especially by bringing into the rpgs but he wouldn't be just expanding into rpgs uh so i thought this was a good time to talk about this one so one of the best things before we get into game recommendations is what I love about games that use the humble D6. So D6, I hope everyone knows is a standard six sided die, you know, one to six, six sides is that most people have them, right? Like, I, I don't know anyone who doesn't have some in their house somewhere, even if they're not gamers, right? Like someone's got that copy of Monopoly with six sets of hoses in it, and it probably has two D6. Actually, it's probably got four D6 in it because you only need two. Uh, and that's why you see so many games designed just to use the standard six-sided die, especially independent uh, designers tend to do this, right? So it's not 
why um so you don't have to buy anything else to play the game and it's a side note it's also why you see so many games that use a standard deck of cards for the same reason it's almost everyone has a deck of cards so tonight we're going to list off some of the best games that need little more than just some dice now some of these may require to print something off and many are going to require some kind of pen pencil paper but you're not going to need any fancy gaming supplies you're not going to need polyhedral dice or thick rule books or miniatures pawns meeples resource cubes or any of that fancy stuff even if you don't have a printer as some people are going more digital than ever these days you can mm. usually find a way to read or mark up sheets on a mobile device if there isn't, and in many cases, turns out to be a mobile app to manage the paper uh, aspects. Yeah. yeah, to be honest, I didn't dive into it, but when we get into the games here tonight, many of these have mobile implementations, and many are pass and play. But I was looking for physical, tabletop, not digital. So I'm going to start off with the two Jeff mentioned, uh, just for people out there that aren't Jeff who may be looking for free D6-based games. Uh, yes, you can buy copies of these two particular games, but the full rules and score sheets are available online for free, and I'm pretty sure you're not copyright infringing or anything like this. I think they're they're common market or out of copyright. I don't know. As far as I can tell, it's legal to, to grab these games online. So first up is Yahtzee. Uh, this is obviously the classic and most well-known roll-and-write game in the world or at least in North America. Actually, to be honest, I don't know if it's something that people in Germany play or not. Uh, pretty much everyone I know, and most people who are listening, I'm sure know this one. Uh, my favorite version is a travel version that was out in the 80s, and it was awesome. It was in this plastic blue thing that you rolled the dice and you pushed the back of it to lock them. But you know what? That wasn't free, so it doesn't really belong on this list. But Yahtzee, like, uh, come on, roll, roll your five dice, re-roll up to twice, trying to make sets. Five dice, a pencil, and some scrap paper, and you're good to go. But there are also many, many free Yahtzee scoring apps for all oh, yeah. mobile platforms, both official Yahtzee uh, branded or just, you know, Yahtzee, called Yahtzee uh, scoring apps. And that just takes the, uh, the ease of, of having to worry about math out of it. Yep. All right, next is Farkle. Uh, this is the other game that Jeff mentioned. Now, this one, I had no clue about growing up. I don't know how. I, I missed this one. It's, it's as far as I can tell, about as ubiquitous as Yahtzee. Um, this one, I actually learned through Facebook. Uh, this was one of those Facebook acts that I was addicted to at one time, along with, you know, Words with Friends and Candy Crush. Yes, I played Candy Crush. I don't know many people who didn't. I still play match three games, just not Candy Crush. Uh, this is a neat pusher lock dice game that I actually found way more fun than Yahtzee. I find Farkle a much more enjoyable experience than Yahtzee. But again, just needs, I think it's five dice, it might be six. Well, uh, that was Farkle. All right, on to some new recommendations for Jeff here. So Liar's Dice. Uh, we brought this one up a couple times when talking like about six player games last week. It's another classic. The rules can be easily found online. There's even a Wikipedia page that tells you how to play. Uh, it has the added benefit of not needing a pencil and paper. All you do need is five dice and a cup, but you need that for every player. So this one might be a bit rough unless you are a gamer and have a ton of dice in your house, but you don't know. Never know. Um, what you do need, the, the cup's optional. You just need some way to hide the dice from the other players. Uh, this is a great big group game because you can literally play with as many people as you want as long as you have cups and dice. That's awesome. And that was Liar's Dice. Next up is Bunko. Mm -hmm. This dice game is designed to be played with 12 players, but it can be played by any number divisible by four. You need at least three dice for each group, so 12 D6 in total. This game, players are trying to roll triplets on their three dice with bonus points awarded for hitting the same number as the round number called the Bunko. Obviously, this game is played over six rounds. Nice if you got a big group, and that was Bunko. Next, you have Ship Captain Crew. This is a really simple game. This is a bar game. This is the kind of thing people usually play with drinks involved. All it needs is five dice. You're going to get three rolls to try to roll a six, which represents the ship, a five, which represents the captain, and a four, which represents the crew. If you manage to do that in three rolls, the other two dice is your score. You add those up. Whoever has the highest score wins. Whoever loses, drinks, you know, it's a drinking game. What I thought was fascinating about this game is this is pretty much the system that Tower of Madness used, that kerplunk based game, right. which I had no idea at the time was based on a classic bar dice game. Go. And that was Ship Captain Crew. Next up is Sid Jackson's Solitaire Dice. This dice game from the classic game designer, Sid Jackson, is probably 
most well known for a choir and other 70s bookshelf games, is great because you can play it solo. Mm. Well, actually, as the name implies, you can only play it solo. Fair. You just need 5D6, a pencil, and some paper to play. And again, that's Sid Saxon, two S's, not oh, Jackson. Oh, it is Saxon. Oh, you know what? Yeah, okay. Sid Saxon. I thought that was a typo. My bad. <laughs> no, no, not a typo. Sid Saxon, who made a choir in uh, a whole bunch of old Avalon Hill games, one of the famous ones. Um, that is another one you can find the rules online. It's also sometimes just called Solitaire. Uh, what we will do too is we're going to drop links to all these in the show notes. Uh, we're not going to drop them in the chat tonight, but in the show notes, you'll have links to where you can get all of these free games. That was Sid Saxon's Solitaire Dice. Another famous game designer putting out a free dice game is Rainier Nizia's Decathlon. Dr. Nizia has this dice game up for free on his personal website. It's a family weight roll and write that needs 8d6. And what's neat in this game is you actually play through 10 different micro games each representing different events in a decathlon, and then it's whoever won the most of the events that wins the overall thing. So it's a bunch of different neat dice-based games all in one game. That was Rainier Nitsa's Decathlon. Now next up is one I play on a regular basis digitally, Can't Stop. Four dice and a piece of paper or whiteboard and some markers, you too can play this push-your-luck dice game. You just need 11 columns representing the numbers from 2 to 12, some markers to keep track of where everyone's place on the board and then you roll those four dice and see what columns you can advance on using uh groups of dice okay. you can only move on three columns during your turn though so if you don't roll one of those three numbers that you chose uh that you've chosen on a on a uh following turn you're out and you have to move back to where you started from so that is can't stop can't stop a classic i still want a physical copy of this somehow like like a nice wooden board or plastic or something it's it just I, I think it'd be a great game for for easy mode nights or if we happen to start doing a bar night or something or even new year's eve i just think that it as there's something to play before people show up there are some fantastic diy versions that came oh, yeah. out there the people who love this game go crazy for designing oh, yeah. boards about it it's really both mm -hmm. bizarre and interesting at the same time. All right, up next we have Utopia Engine. This one just looks really cool. This is a free print and play dice game for one player. It's a one sheet. You print it out. It's got all kinds of nice artwork on it and all these boxes you're going to start crossing off. And what you're doing is you are rolling dice to try to build this fanciful device from the distant past, trying to stop an incoming doomsday. All you need is 2d6 a pencil and an eraser, which is important because there is stuff you're going to mark off and then cross out. And well, the one page sheet that you can get free online. And that was Utopia Engine. Next up is 30 Rails, a dice game about building railway networks onto a six by six grid of squares. Mm -hmm. The name comes from the fact that it's played over 30 turns. Wow. Each dice, tur uh, each turn, dice are rolled to determine which track you have to place and in what row column you have to place it. There's cool. even an advanced game that includes stocks and shares. One of the more complex I, ones on our list, I think. Yeah, definitely. You know what sounds cool about this? This sounds like an early version of Railroad Inc. Absolutely. Like that, it, <laughs> it, it sounds like a, a free, yeah. non-specialty dice version of Railroad Inc. And I think Railroad Inc. is a really cool game. So this one looks really neat to me. This of the list just kind of really spoke to me. Well, then and that one is, interesting thing about this uh, is that not only is Railroad Inc., uh, you almost suffer from too many choices. Yes. Whereas this one, uh, the dice give you uh, are more controlling. Yeah. Uh, so. And that was thirty rails. Next, I have the Great Races. Uh, this is a dice game using a dedicated score sheet. Players roll their dice and gather them in pairs. Each line in the score sheet represents a different race. The pairs are going to get added together, so you're going to have your, all your numbers on 2d6. The first player to complete any... Um, a complete a set of... Uh, sorry, complete one set. One column wins that race. At the end, the game ends when every race is completed. The player with the most races wins the overall game. And I gotta say, this is very similar to Kent's Stop, but takes out that whole push your luck element. If right. you can't place your dice, you can't, you're just done. Like you take a turn, I take a turn, you take a turn, I take a turn. Which, so which, there is some. Yeah. It's either the benefit or the downfall. Some people really love yeah. that push your luck, whereas some people might 
hesitate from you know the uh, inevitable anger that comes when you've just moved yeah, 12 you just keep you know, rolling you're so close thing. to winning and then you're done you're out yeah. and you lost everything and that was the great races and next up the mini quest here's one for the fantasy adventure fans it plays two to three players and you just need three dice a pencil an eraser and the free print and play rules and sheets players play heroes that travel around a hex map gaining loot, and eventually taking on the boss. I gotta say, this one looks really neat. This is one I'm tempted to download myself and check out. It's got a got a good fantasy Zelda D&D kind of feel to it. And that is the mini quest. Next, I've got 13 sheep. This is a quick roll and write where players draw fences to protect as many of their sheep before the wolves come. Each turn, players roll a die to determine what type of fence they have to draw. The game lasts seven to 10 rounds because those last few rounds, if you roll sixes, the game comes to an end, where if you don't, it keeps going all the way to 10. At the end of the game, you get one point based on every protected sheep you have. This seems like a variation of 30 rails almost. Uh, where It sounds much simpler, you know, but yeah. You're, you're, you're looking for enclosures rather than roots, but, you know, very similar sort of concept. And that was... Yeah, it's got a definite um, roll to see what you play seemed to be a common roll and write mechanic. Uh, yep. uh, here's a chart. You get this thing. Now draw that thing. Yep. And that was 13 sheep. Now moving over to the RPG side of things. All right, so soon as I got this question and it said the RPG multiverse, something popped in my head right away. And anyone who is a fan of Star Wars probably thought the same thing if they know about this. And that is the Open D6 system. This is the system that West End Games used for their cinematic RPGs. Now, that includes Ghostbusters and a couple other games, but the most famous is their Star Wars D6 system, the WEG, W-E-G, Star Wars system. Now, after they lost the Star Wars license and then there was, to Wizards of the Coast, there was some other other mess going on here with licenses but eventually they released the base d6 system at, under the ogl or the open gaming license which is something that started year 2000 with dnd 3.5 or 3 third edition dnd what this means is now that base system behind star wars is free to be used by any designers and now some companies have taken that license and produced retail games that you can buy there are a handful that took that open license and used it to release open and free games and that is the west end games open d6 system now some specific examples of the open d6 system uh they're really generically named so it's pretty obvious you have d6 space for playing sci-fi and space opera uh you have d6 fantasy for doing dungeon crawls and epic quests you got d6 adventure this is for anything from old west to pulp to modern uh, there are other ones out there. There's D6 Legends and so on. Again, these are the three I would recommend. All right. Uh, another example of an uh, open D6 fantasy game that was published and available for sale is Azamar. It is now available for uh, pay what you want in PDF format. Yeah, this is one I actually physically own uh, because I got it at the same time from the same publisher. They put out a game. I kickstarted this. I paid to kickstart the game. It's called Westward. It's a cattle punk western sci-fi steampunk. There's steam mechs and cows and cattle, but it's set in space. So, like, think of the um, space sci-fi as in, like, Firefly, like the, the outback when they land right. on the planets without the spaceships. You're never leaving the planet. So a really unique setting. I loved the, the cover art shows the steam mech pulling a horse-drawn wagon, not being drawn by horses, but by a mech. And I just thought it was fantastic. I had to get that. This is now available free with the basic version. Now, the basic version is a non-searchable, low-res PDF. It's just pictures of the sheets, right? It's not scanned in, but you can get that free. It's got the full rules, and it uses the OpenD6 system. The other thing, too, is this features some awesome artwork from a personal friend of mine, Rob Chope. So that's just a nice shout out to Rob because I, 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 I made that connection and got his artwork <laughs> in that book, and I'm proud of that. All right. Well, another RPG worth checking out, especially if playing with younger kids, is D6 Dungeons. It's specifically designed for new players and younger players with little to no RPG experience. Yeah, this is one that's even simpler than the Open D6 system. And speaking of that, someone really simplified the Open D6 system and they released it as called Mini 6. So it's a super light version of the Open D6 system with even more streamlined rules. Now, this is just a generic system that you can do what you want with. 
And then another D6 base system that has nothing to do with Open D6, this is completely original system, is the PIP system quick start rules. Uh, this is from Aloy La Santa, Aloy the Saint um, of Third Eye Games. These are the games that drive purchasable games like Mermaid Adventures. Now, I've mentioned Mermaid Adventures on the show before. This was one of the first games I used to introduce my girls to deep through RPGs. And all you need to be able to play that game, besides the book and pens and papers, is two different colors of D6. They recommend black and white, but you can use two any other colors. It's dead simple. You roll the white dice based on all your skills, and you count successes for or higher. The black dice are the difficulty, which are set by the DM. So it's like, oh, it's a difficulty three task, you're gonna roll three black dice again. Anything that's four, five, or six cancels out successes. If you have more successes than failures, you did what you want. That's a really simple version of the PIP system. The basic quick start rules, which you can use to basically play any type of RPG are available free. All right, well, and while we haven't tried it, I did see that GURPS Light is a <laughs> free system that only uses D6. Fair enough. I, I admit, I'm, I'm kind of surprised there's groups out there for light, but that's cool. Steve Jackson Games, give them back. All right, I'm going to leave you with one. Uh, we actually recommend this a lot on the, the podcast, surprisingly, for how little we've actually played, and that's Fate Core. Um, now, normally, you would need fudge dice, or there's modern Fate dice, but you need special dice that have pluses and minuses on them to play any Fate games. But you know what? There's nothing to stop you from using a normal D6. One to two is minus, three to four is blank, five to six is plus. Yeah, it would take a bit to get your mind around it, but it works. Now, Fate is very different from traditional role-playing games. So Jeff in particular, going back to the original question, is talking about getting into RPGs, and I honestly have no idea if Fate would be a fantastic, awesome way to experience RPGs for the first time because it would be such a different perspective from what I grew up with. Or a terrible idea, because the whole idea of aspects and storytelling is so different. I really don't know. All I know is that if you start role-playing with Fate, you're going to be in a different boat than most of us out here. Well, that's it for our thoughts on free D6-based games. Now let's head over to Lobby and see if the awesome folk gathered there have anything to add. Well... In the lobby, we see uh, <laughs> Red Meeple Ryan, who's calling uh, your one suggestion there, Cattle Tech. Uh, Cattle the, Tech, uh, okay. For the, 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 the sci sci-fi Western. Uh, I like it. I like. Uh, so I, I, they 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 coined the term. Well, they didn't coin the term, but I made them use on their Kickstarter the term Cattle Punk, right. which is something I first read a long time ago in Knights of the Dinner Table, and I always liked that term because it wasn't just cowboys and Indians, right? There's there's a little bit more to that punk feel, right? The, the, the little more badass. It's not just black and white. It's more rage against the authority. You're playing the rebels, not not the uh, you're not the sheriff, right? So right. I kind of like that feel. I admit Westward's a really neat game, and Azamar is the fantasy version of that in my head, though I know Azamar came out first. But those are both games that like cost real money for a long time. That now the publishers have have since moved on to other things. It's uh, Wicked North Games is the company that publishes both of them. Right. Uh, I am surprised. No one in the chat knows any um, free D6 based game. I expected like just a wave of independent RPGs that people could play to come from our chat room. Maybe RPG, we need Jeff's. Well, we mentioned Fiasco yesterday or last week. Uh, Fiasco is uh, not available and, free though. And no, Fiasco is not free. And then uh, Durant's, but again, I don't think that's free. Either. No, that's that's the but, follow up uh, to Fiasco from the same designer, um, Jason Morningstar. Unless yeah. unless the fiasco like SRD is available free. So Spirit of the Century, so the original Fate games before Fate Core, those are available free. Uh, there's an SRD that was called Spirit of the Century is the game that took Fudge, which is a generic use of universal role-playing system, not GURB, so I don't know what Fudge stands for, that came up with Fudge Dice. A game was created for that called Spirit of the Century. That is available free. Um, there are there you go. Uh, Red Meeple Ryan is pointing out that there are battle tech quick start rules. At that point, though, you're getting into standees or miniatures, though, like that. That's pushing the yeah, all yeah. you need is six level. Yes, I guess you could print and play the little standees. Yeah, no, it's fair. Like, I to, to admit, I did not write this list off the top of my head. It took some research to come up with these games. Some I knew right away. I'm like, oh, man. In particular, I was going to point out a, a certain Star Wars game, but I have since learned that the um, it is not light under used under license. So right. we are not going to mention that one in particular. I thought it was. I thought it was. Like, not that I thought LucasArts or Disney gave them the permission, but I thought because of how it was published, 
Like it's something you can buy a physical copy of, but no, I RPG geek very clearly explained right. that it was not something. And we are not advocating ever piracy. No, no, absolutely not. Now, Again, Fiasco is only $12 for the core set, and they are pointing out in the chat room that once you get the core, there are many yes. play sets that are free. Yep. No, so that's true. Play sets for are free. For $12, you get you get your 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 PDFs and your and your Mobies and all your all your fancy digital files, and then it can be free from that point on. So, depending on uh, whether you want to go that direction or not. CeeLo. I don't know CeeLo. It's not one I know. C C Sewer Rat Zero says CeeLo. I don't gambling works, right? Like, like we could have put craps on this list, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Craps, fair enough. It's just I don't. Craps to me is not a family game. That no. was a because he was looking to play with a family, and to me, craps is definitely gambling. But you know, like Farkle is basically gambling, right? And to be honest, like this was a a very short list. There are a lot more free rolling rights out there. Uh, what I'll probably do in the show notes is I'll drop a link because there are a couple really good. There's one that's like 13 pages long. This geek list on Board Game Geek, which I use to get some of these suggestions. And what I did was I looked at the higher ratings and I read through how to play the games. I actually downloaded the PDFs and read them and basically went, would I play this or not? And so, that's how I made the determination. Interesting, actually. I'd never actually heard of the game CeeLo before, and it's CeeLo, yep. CeeLo, C-E-E-L-O. Uh, it's a uh, gambling game played with three six-sided dice. Uh, apparently, it was the most popular dice game played by Chinese Americans in 1893. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> oh, is that the with the bowl, probably? Uh, I, I'm not sure, but apparently that's actually where you go. CeeLo Green, who's a modern uh, artist, and apparently there are many hip-hop artists who refer to CeeLo it's it's a gambling game that's commonly Fair referred enough. to. I, I'm surprised I've never actually. It's just come probably the it. game they are playing in Bug Trouble in Little China. More than which I guess. Fair yeah. enough. Uh, yeah, that's a whole new. Or new one to Geek me. Award runner up Roll Estate by Chris M of Flip the Table. Is that D sixes only? There are a lot of rolling rights out there. There are an awful lot, but a, quite a few of them require a little bit more, and quite a few cost money. Yeah. Finding free rolling rights was a little more difficult. Uh, Three dollars for roll estate. At PNP, okay, so at it, it's Arcade. available. It's cheap. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the question wasn't cheap games. Yeah. <laughs> we were looking for free ones, and like I said, there are more. There are a lot more. These are the ones that like I said either caught my eye or had really good um, really good ratings, like over six or seven. I don't expect a rolling right to have an eight or a nine, right? I wasn't looking for eights and nines. I was looking for anything above a six, to be honest. Okay, this is unexpected. Valeria Card Kingdoms as a PNP. But that, you'd have to print an awful lot, I well, would yeah, think. Well, yeah, it's 119 pages. So yeah, you're, paying, like, you're paying $10 for the download, and then you're paying like 40 bucks well, for if, ink and paper. <laughs> If you're stuck at home, I, I guess, guess it's a way to do it. But yeah, right now, that's the game of the week at uh, PNP Arcade is oh, Valeria dude. Card Kingdoms. Danielle just pointed out, I hadn't even thought of that. All the Lasers and Feelings games we were talking about last week. There we those go. Those only use D6s? Yeah. I forgot those only use D6s. I that's completely right. forgot about that. So yeah, Lasers and Feelings, um, Love and Justice, um, Rocker Boys and Vending Machines, and all the other various versions of those. I think Lady ba Blackbird also may be D6-based. If Lady Blackbird, that's a fantastic free RPG. Now, none of those I would recommend to a brand new group. Like, Jeff, I think this would be a terrible choice. Like, right. I don't think you would know what to do with a X and X game if you didn't know what role-playing was ahead of time. Right. Like, those sheets don't tell you what a DM is or how to play or any of that, right? It's all just for information on how to make characters, and you'd probably be lost. So not the best recommendations for Jeff, but great recommendations for people who know what they're doing. And not in, in general for, for PNP, and again, I'm not going to say these are all D6 games. I, I'm not going to go through them all right now. But if you go to pnparcade.com, yes. they have a, a collection of free games – uh, most of the mint games are free right now. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Tiny Farms, Twin Stars, Wildest West, Two Rooms in a Boom. Uh, there's uh, five pages of free games wow. right now on PNP Arcade. That no, are all I, admit, free. I, I did look at that. That's Utopia Engine comes from there on our list. Of of the ones I looked at, that one really jumped out to me. Yep. As being a D6 game, too. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so again, for, for maybe not for the D6 players, but for players in general, especially right now, where we're all hungry for, for content, yep. uh, PNP Arcade, free, uh, collect, slash collections, slash D-games. 
Totally fair. Yeah, we'll throw links to all this into the show notes. I thought it was an Absolutely. interesting topic, to be honest. Yep. I thought I thought it was. I had fun doing the research for this one. We'll put it that way. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll sit down and try them all at some point and review them because I'm going to run out of review content. But actually, I made some contacts recently, so maybe that won't happen. Well, yeah. So uh, Ryan's pointing out, role player is actually yeah. the opposite of Valeria, where it's cheaper to go buy. It, it's cheaper to buy a retail copy yeah, yeah. than to print it and buy all the dice. Meters. Well, yeah, and I think Valeria is probably about the same. Like right? it's just yeah, it's like, so expensive. Unless to you're going to play in black and white. Yeah, yeah. Or you happen to work in an office that's not going to mind you using their printer. That, that's how I used to justify some of my <laughs> print and play purchases. Well, and, also, and yes, I, I had permission. I would not steal office resources. We were allowed to use the printer for personal use within reason. Yeah. And for the number of people printing off sports betting sheets, I did not feel guilty printing off my RPG content. <laughs> yeah, no. I. You know what? I have to say, and there's no real shuffling in, in Valeria. I was going to say, I would never no. want a card game where you shuffle, but there is no shuffling no, in there Valeria. Is not. It's not so a deck builder. It's in capital. that way, it's actually not that bad. You don't need the card stock no cards, exactly especially. You just print it on paper and black and white and be able to play yep cthulhu dice is one that's always in my bag if i missed mentioning the plethora of steve jackson dice games the thing with it sewer rat zero was the, the 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 question was specifically standard d6 one to six okay. almost all those steve jackson dice games use unique dice right like that's why king of tokyo doesn't work we aren't just looking for rolling rights and we're not just looking like like that's also why railroad inc wouldn't work because it uses unique d6s okay. we were looking for free games to play with standard D6s, one to six, six sides. Though, to be fair, if it's a six-sided dice, you can build yourself a little translation chart. Oh, yes. Yes, easy, fair, enough. fair enough. But then, then you're also getting into almost stealing people's games, right? Because yeah, Cthulhu, true. like those Steve Jackson games are purchasable. They're not free games. So, yes, you can make a free version of most board games. I can make a free <laughs> version of Terraforming Mars yep. with pencils and crayons, but that's doing a disservice to the designers of the game, in my opinion. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think there's enough free people out there. Well, I think that's it for our topic tonight. Yeah. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over at the blog, tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on gaming advice at the top of the page. You invest in those copies. <laughs> Up next, a look at the Clans of Caledonia, an economic board game set in the 19th century Scotland. Uh, Clans of Caledonia was designed by Juma Ajuju, features art from Clemens Franz, it was kickstarted in 2017, funded in under three hours, published in North America by Karma Games. Since being published, it has been nominated for seven awards, including the Golden Geek, that's a Board Game Geek Awards, Best Strategy Game and Game of the Year. Though it did fail to win any of them, but still, that many nominations, you know you got a gem here. Now, instead of going through what you get in the box bit by bit, I would like to direct everyone to check out our Clans of Caledonia unboxing video on YouTube to see everything you get in this heavy box. Yeah, heavy for sure. This is one of the most densely packed board game boxes I have ever opened or picked up. Uh, there are a ton of wooden components and a ridiculously thick stack of cardboard punch outs included with this game uh, like this is more than an inch like, this is a crazy amount uh, all i'm going to say here is you get a lot for what you're paying for this game and everything is top-notch quality and that's even in the retail version because man the kickstarter even had mono coins and even more shiny bits even the retailer is, is really impressed by what you get well can you give us a quick overview of what players are doing in clans of caledonia i mean it's scotland so there must be sheep right uh, there are sheep. Uh, they are a production building, technically, in this game, and they produce wool. Uh, now, I'm not sure how quick I can get through this one, because this is a heavier game. It's up there. It's not heavy, but it's a, it's a heavier game with a lot going on, with a lot of options. But I'll see what I can do to keep it fairly short. Now, we're going to actually talk about theme, because I was writing this up earlier today and went, you know what, I should probably mention the theme, because I'm terrible at that. So in Clans of Caledonia, you're going to take on the role of one of the many Scottish clans in the 19th century. Uh, this is basically the Industrial Revolution period of Scotland, and you are working to improve Scotland through expansion, trade, and export. Again, it's a rather heavy economic game uh, based around getting production buildings out on the map to produce resources, refining some of those resources, buying and selling both refined and unrefined resources, and fulfilling export contracts. When you fulfill export contracts, you're going to get some points and bonuses, but you're also going to import goods into Scotland. At the same time, players are also trying to spread out on the map and establish a large number of settlements. So sheep, wool, land, food, maybe some nice scotch too? 
Oh, of course, there's whiskey as well. It wouldn't be a true game about Scotland without whiskey. This is one of the refined goods that you can turn your grain into whiskey barrels. Now, all this is done through players taking a number of actions each round until everyone passes. Just keeps going around until everyone passes. It usually happens when players are out of money. Now, the actions you can take, there are eight of them, so this will take a little bit to go through, but I'm going to simplify them. It's trade. You're going to use your merchants to buy or sell goods on the market. After each transaction, the value is going to be adjusted based on how many goods were bought or sold. So there's an economic engine. It's not just this cost of this, period. Yes. Yeah, very clear. Like, actually, a really nice engine. It's one of the better economic systems I've seen in a game. Um, you can obtain one of those export contracts. You're going to take one from a, a central board, pay its cost. What's important is each player can only have one of these. I assume they're powerful enough that holding multiple would be a game breaker. It's not really powerful. It just, it would totally change the game. Like it would just be a very different game if I could just collect all the markets because being stuck with just one and you're stuck with it, you can't discard it. All you can do is fulfill it or not. And if you don't, it's stuck there year after year after year until you fulfill it. So that is a big part of the game and choosing which tile is one of the biggest decisions you have to make. Also, at the start of the game, the first one you buy is probably going to drive your entire direction for the rest of the game. It's going to show you what engine you're going to try to build for. Now, what's interesting is having room for two is actually one of the special abilities of one of the clans. More about that later. Now, the next action is expand. Take one of your production buildings or one of your workers from your player board, place it out on the map, paying any costs. Now, when placing one, you could get what's called the neighborhood bonus. And what this is, is if you place next to another person's player's production building, you can then buy those goods at a discounted price. What's interesting here, though, is you're not buying it off the other player. They get no reward out of this. You're just buying it off that market at a discounted price. I could make sheep jokes here, but I won't. No, there is no wood to trade, at least, so you can't make the Catan joke. Uh, upgrade shipping. Uh, you start on a shipping track normally. You can only place your buildings next to each other, and there are a bunch of rivers on the board. Once you upgrade your shipping once, allows you to go over those rivers. Once you upgrade it more, you can actually go over locks. So similar in some ways to the shipping in Terra Mystica. Uh, it's similar, but not identical. Uh, the one thing that's different here is you can't ship up or down a river like you can in Terra Mystica. All river shipping lets you do is jump over that river. So it basically gets rid of a barrier or a fence. Now, having three shipping means you can't build three hexes away down a river, but it does mean you could build, say, four hexes away if you're crossing four locks. Now, the next action is upgrade technology. This is a way to improve your tools and it makes your workers generate more income every turn. As straightforward as any technology in any game will ever get. Yeah, pretty much. There's two different ones you can improve. Uh, you can hire a merchant. You start with two of them. They allow you to do two transactions in that economic market. Where you can buy more up to a maximum of seven throughout the game. Uh, back to those export contracts, you can fulfill one. If you have the goods depicted on the contract, you get the rewards. And you can then take another contract? Yep, by using that export contract action we mentioned earlier. I've gone and paying the cost to take it. Uh, and then finally, pass. Pass is an action. This ends your turn, but it also sets the turn order for next turn on who passes first. Plus, you get an amount of money with the players who pass first getting more money than the players who pass later. So you can play longer and achieve more or end sooner and gain more cash. Correct. And go earlier in the next round, which can be really important if you really want to get that hot export contract. Now, once you've all passed, so everyone's gone around the table, everyone's taken the pass action, you're going to go into a production phase. Uh, this is where you're going to get stuff based on what's in play, what's on the board. And the WIS is done by looking at your player board, and it just tells you your totals. Uh, you're also going to get to refine your goods. So some of the goods you produce can be turned into other goods that are worth more on the market. So, for example, a field produces two grain. Well, a bakery can turn one of those grain into bread. And a distillery can convert one of those grain into a whiskey, but you could also just sell the grain. So there's a, there's definitely some thinking, and it's going to depend on what export contracts you have, which of those goods you need. Cheap food and scotch, a great Scottish tradition. <laughs> now the final phase is scoring. Every round you're going to get glory. Glory is the victory points in this game based on whatever the token is up. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to randomize and put out five tokens, and they're all going to score different things, and it's completely random every time. After the last round, there's an end game scoring. Here, you're going to get points for all the glory you've gotten so far in the game, which just makes sense. So that, that'll be very similar to people who played Terraforming Mars. You're going to start off at whatever your Terraforming rating is. Uh, then you're going to take all your leftover goods and you get to sell them. You get points for how much money you have. Uh, the number of imported goods you have. 
So there are three different types of imported goods. And what you get, this part's neat, is based on how many have been imported overall. So there's three import goods. There's, I'm going to forget because I didn't write them down here, tobacco, sugar cane, and something else. I forget what the last one is. I apologize. Um, depending on how many imp are imported, they're worth different amounts. So the one that's been imported the least is worth the most points. So there's a whole rarity system in play there that I thought was really neat. And then you're going to get a point for the number of settlements you own on the board. So interesting that the, the economic engine uh, continues into that scoring phase mm -hmm. as well, adding rarity uh, into, the, into the value there as well. So again, it's five rounds of scoring plus an additional scoring round, or is the fifth round, the final round, the, the, the fifth scoring round? No. So you, you play five full rounds. Each round ends with a scoring phase. So you finish that fifth round, you finish the fifth scoring phase, then you do an additional end game okay. scoring. The where scoring you're scoring completely different things. You're no right. longer scoring the little token. You're scoring, scoring a, the, the list I just went through. Now, all these rules can be modified by the player's clan. This is one of those highly asymmetric games. Every clan is completely different from each other. Uh, some examples. Clan Buchanan has a second export box. That's the one I mentioned earlier. Clan Campbell gets a discount on all buildings that process goods, but not just the generic goods, just the processing ones. Clam Cunningham is known for their milk, or sorry, butter, for their butter. And what they can do is they can sell their milk throughout the game for more than it normally costs because it represents converting that milk into butter, which I thought was really neat. Uh, Clam Ferguson starts with more meeples on the board. Clam McDonald has like a weird rule where they can place workers out on locks and they represent fishermen. And during the game, they can move the fishermen around in the locks. Like they have really different abilities for each of the, 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 the different clans. So very much like Terra Mystica in that the, the clan you choose, much like your race in uh, Terra Mystica, yeah massively influences how you're going to play the game correct yeah it's definitely different uh they, they each play different and they're going to give you a direction almost right from the beginning of the game if you're going to get extra money every time you sell goods you're going to spend most of the game trying to sell goods if you're clam buchanan and you want to make milk you're probably going to try to get lots of cows out there to get lots of milk so you can convert it to butter um i gotta say one of the signs uh no i didn't give a disclaimer at the start of this review that's because i bought this game this is a good indication of how much I expected to like this game. This isn't a review copy. This is something I went down to Hugen & Munin, our local gaming store, and picked up and spent my good money on. And I am happy to report I don't regret this purchase in any way whatsoever. I greatly enjoy this game. Now, longtime fans know how much I like asymmetric games. So right there, there's a win, right? Clans of Caledonia is up there for having some of the most asymmetric powers, player powers out there. And there's lots of them. There's eight or nine clans in the game. I forget. And you're only playing four players. So it goes both places. Um, I, I love how everything looks. Like the, the, the meeple are all unique, which I thought was really nice. It was a nice touch. Every, every resource looks different. Every they, they have a different texture, a different width they're all different colors having unique wooden pieces for all the different buildings is a huge bonus i would have liked the metal coins from the kickstarter but hey i didn't kickstart it i'd be tempted but other than that i'm really happy with this because you know what if this would have been a mayfair game or a rio grande game especially from a couple years ago i would have just had a bunch of different colored cubes and maybe cardboard chits it's really nice to have the uniquely shaped meeples which is also something that helps the game be more accessible with people with vision problems, which thankfully I don't have, but is a selling point and it's great to see. For the record, this game was purchased at the CG Realm. Hugen and Munin went out of business a number of years ago. Yeah, it's today's the time travel episode <laughs> where May comes before June. Come on, Hugen and Munin can still be there. Yes, I apologize. The CG Realm here in Windsor, Ontario. And great May does always... At least they, one of the owners is the same. There's... And May always does come before June, but not before <laughs> April. There you go. I don't, I don't even know. It, it's quarantine <laughs> time. I can't even say it. Quarantine. All right. Um, so some p potential negatives. Uh, the learning curve steep. Uh, uh, you got eight different actions, right? So any game where I have to explain to you eight different things you can do on your turn and why you might want to do them makes it hard to learn. But um, they're easy to understand. Each of those eight actions is not difficult. The weight of the game comes with the interactions of those actions and how your actions are going to affect the other players and how their actions are going to affect you. Now, there's no direct conflict. There's no stealing people's resources. There's no removing another player's thing from the map. There's The Scottish clans can't go to war in this game. Uh, but there is a ton of indirect conflict. Map positioning can be huge. 
who gets a spot first, especially with those rules at the end of the game for how many different colonies you have. The timing on buying and selling on goods is huge because the market fluctuates. So if you can get in and sell before someone buys, you're going to get more money and so on, right? That, that is another big one. And one of the things that's huge in this game, as I kind of hinted at earlier, are those export tiles. Being able to get the tiles you want and you can fulfill or possibly deny someone else from getting one. If you can get a contract and you've already got the goods in front of you, you're laughing, right? You want people to be able to have to pick up um, export tiles they have to work for. Or if you've got the goods in front of you, you want to make sure you go first to get that one tile you can already fulfill. And uh, as for conflict, the Scotch were far more worried about those Southern English uh, <laughs> problem people. So uh, they weren't too busy fighting with themselves. Well, I'm sure there were enough Scots fighting against themselves, but that, especially with all that whiskey going on, but I'm sure those were more personal fights. Uh, overall, Clans of Caledonia is a meaty economic game with a ton of inter indirect player interaction, um, where long-term strategy and planning can really pay off, uh, where you have to be willing to adapt and change your plans, though, when based on what the other players are doing. It can be unforgiving of mistakes, but to me, that's a feature of the game and not a flaw. Uh, you can make mistakes and you can be out of it. Uh, it's going to be difficult to recover if you make a big enough mistake. But that, to me, is what these heavier strategy games are all about. If you like heavier strategy, Euro games, economic games, I strongly suggest checking this game out. All right. Well, now it's already come in the chat room and, <laughs> and I've pointed it out. Many people out there like to compare this game to Gaia Project and Terra Mystica. What are your <sighs> thoughts on that? I, I get it and I don't. Like, I can see it, but I, I just don't see why they need to be lumped in the same group. They're not similar enough. Like, there are some similarities, but, like, every board game has similarities to another game. It's like saying that, that Clank and Dominion are, are the same game. They're too similar. I'm like, yeah, they're both deck builders, so of course they have some similarities. Like, yeah, you're doing the whole take things off your player board, and then that tells you your income. Okay, I get it, but you know what? Eclipse does that. Tapestry does that. Like, it's not just these three games that have that player board. So to me, I mean, it's it's got the player board. It's got the hex map of yeah. playing. There is interaction in that if you build something next to someone, you are getting a lower price when you build when you do something. You know, there there are a number of similarities. Now I totally see where the economic engine in this blows away a lot of things that Terra yeah. Mystica has going on. Like that's fantastic. But uh, if you look at the contract, if you look at the the, the way the rel you know you randomize what the uh, uh, what the scoring is for each round, the same way you do in Terra Mystica. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there there are a significant number of similarities that I think encourage people to drop these together, even if when you get down to the nitty gritty and you actually sit down and play it, the the economic aspects of it differentiate it massively well, yeah. away from Terra Mystica. Uh, well, gee, but again, besides, on the surface, besides, it sorry. really looks like it. <laughs> uh, besides just the market, there's also the fulfilling of goods. The whole thing in this is fulfilling contracts. There's none of that in Gaia Project or Terra Mystica. You're not trying to produce resources to fulfill an order. Like, that's a totally different type of game. Like, no, yes. But, but, you, but, the, but there are things in, uh, in, in Terra Mystica where, you know, if you've, you've got your, uh, your, the tokens, when you, when you pass your turn, you pick up your token and no, you're not trying to fulfill that but you are getting bonuses based on what you do on that tag so if you know if i pick up the one that's going to give me bonuses every time i build a you know uh, a trading house i'm going to be building trading houses that yeah. that turn based on that token i have picked up so again uh, a see, to me that's like a generic different. euro game again, thing similar it, it's because of the number of similarities even though again the games are very different yeah, I don't know. Like, like yes, you're placing stuff on a hex map. Yeah, there's a thing where if I place next to you, something happens. Okay, that's in both games. <laughs> Though what happens is completely different. I got it. Yeah, okay. And, and yes, there's the asymmetric player powers. Now that one, that yes, the, the, the clans do feel kind of like the various different factions of the other game. But again, that's something that's in other games, right? Like Zolkin has that. You're going to draft. Actually, Zolkin, Zolkin with Tribes and Prophecies is really close to this because one of the things you do in this that I skipped over, it's in my full review, is 
is you play out a number of clans equal to the players plus one, and then there's starting resource tokens that are placed next to them. So you're going to pick a clan and a starting resource token to see what you get at the start, instead of like Terra Mystica where you just click the board. Where the token is identical, you literally are going to pick between your various tribes, and there's going to be a starting resource token, and you pick both. And I'm like, to me, the, then why aren't those two games thrown in the same boat? I just, I don't know, it, it, it gets me. That, that, that people like to throw them together. Like, I I, I think they have some things in common. It's it's true. But most board games have things in common with each other. Like, they're inspired by each other. These aren't the same designers. They're not the same publishers. Like, like people seem to talk about this game as, like, the third in the series. And I just, I don't see it as a series. Yes, it, it has some stuff together. I, I don't know. What, whatever. I, personally, I own both. I own Terra Mystica. I own Clans of Caledonia. I played Gaia Project. It, I have a blog post if you want me to compare Terra Mystica Gaia Project. That's not what this is about. I, I think having both is perfectly valid. One doesn't replace or outdo the other. I find my thought process in Clans of Caledonia very different. I'm in a very different brain space when playing this game. This is I'm thinking more economics instead of um, engine optimization. I'm not worrying about points as much as I'm worrying about having the money to complete the actions I want to complete. It's just I don't know. It's a different brain space. I feel they feel like very different games. I personally will get the desire to play one or the other. Right. So. I want to play Terra Mystica. I want to play Clans of Taldonia are two different things. If I say, hey, I want to play Terra Mystica, and someone's like, hey, no, let's play Clans of Taldonia instead, I'd be like, why? Like, I guess if you want, I'll probably do that because I'm a nice guy. But like to me, it's not like, well, we'll play this instead because it's a similar type of game. I, I just don't think liking one means you have to necessarily like the other, and I don't think not liking one of them is going to mean you're not going to like it. So if you hate Terra Mystica, you may love Clans of Caledonia. If you like Terra Mystica, you'll probably like Clans of Caledonia. I don't think if you like Terra Mystica, you probably will like Clans of Caledonia is necessarily valid either. I, each each game, each of the three, Gaia Project as well, stands on its own to me. My my thought on this one is, and again, I have not yet played Clans of Caledonia. I haven't been down since. Uh, but to me, if you like the asymmetrical uh, sort of map-based game style, and you love economic engines, then yeah. I would absolutely recommend Cans of Caledonia. Where so if, if the economic engine and the similarities to Terra Mystica are two yeah. things that are likable. Uh, and yeah. it's a it's a nice way, not necessarily to compare them, but to give you a reference with which to talk about Clans of Caledonia. Uh, imagine Terra Mystica with a kick ass uh, economic engine that you know blows away anything that that, do, uh, that that doesn't exist in Terra Mystica at all. Yeah. But then the opposite like you don't have the god tracks in this. If part of what you like in Terra Mystica is the elemental tracks and going up that and the whole power system, none of that's here, yeah, right? See, and I've I've never really got I, I part of the reason I don't do too well is because I'm not <laughs> very good at using the priests in uh, Terra Mystica. Whereas again, I want to throw Zolkin in the mix cuz Zolkin has god tracks that are really similar to Terra Mystica's elemental tracks. Like, I, it just, it, it's the fact, I know what it is, it's I get frustrated when people go, oh, what's a better game, Terra Mystica or Gaia Project? And someone has to jump in and go, Clans of Caledonia. And I'm like, no, like that's a yeah, different see, that's, game. That's ridiculous. Like that that's where it bugs me. Like people tend to lump these games in as like the, the Star Wars trilogy, all three go together. And I'm like, no, this is like like the, the Ewok movie versus <laughs> which I like because I grew up I was a kid when those right. came out. I was a kid when Jedi came out. So you, you can tell a person's age by whether they love or hate Return of the Jedi. I am in the love theory because Wicked's awesome. Like it's just it's a different yeah, it's it, it's a board game, it's area control, it's it's asymmetric, it's got a bunch of features that I like in games. And those features happen to be in both games, which is why I own both games and why I like both games. All right. Well, for a more <laughs> in-depth look at Clans of Caledonia, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on review. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Uh, every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played uh, and other cool gaming stuff that's been going on, because we aren't really going to any events anymore. That, that's kind of a thing of, of the past, hopefully something that will come back in the future. In them, the May that comes after July. No, that, yeah, May can come after July in my world now. <laughs> this is the running gag tonight. I don't know why. Uh, so, 
Last week, we were here forever. This segment was ridiculously long, over an hour. And Deanna and I played all these games because we had this epic game night, and it was awesome. Well, this week's going to seem kind of sad in comparison. Um, we did play some games, though. Uh, there was the online gaming. Seven Wonders, Race for the Galaxy, started a new Terra Mystica. I should look and see if Clans is anywhere online. Um, but I, we talk about online games enough. What I want to talk about are a couple of physical games we played. So we got in our first two-player game of Eminent Domain with Exotica and got in a couple plays of Woodlands with my kids, actually, just this afternoon. Uh, and I'm back down to uh, my usual BGA games, and that's about it. There was something you were going to try, a solo uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts. Yes, solo. and I just I haven't just had that. No, it's fair. I just I, I, I remembered there was something we mentioned last week. Um, so Clans of Caledonia is on Board Game Arena. There you go. See, we can play. <laughs> it probably is. That's I haven't looked. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I think you'll like it because you like Terra Mystica. <laughs> All right, starting off with Eminent Domain. All right, this is our first time breaking out the Exotica expansion and WoW uh, learning game. Um, I reviewed the rules before starting, and I strongly recommended playing several games of just the base game with Exotica before combining it with the other expansion, Escalation. So we did that. We were smart. We didn't go, ah, oh, we're gamers. Let's throw all together. And I got to admit, I'm glad we did it. Uh, we pulled all the Escalation stuff off out and just played the base Eminent Domain with Exotica. Now, Exotica adds some interesting new stuff to the game. So there's a new world type and a new resource. Now, along with this new world type is a new technology deck specific to that world type, just like in the base game. The new resource works the same as the old ones, like it's identical. So those are just kind of expand on what was already in the game. Asteroids, though, are something completely new. They are added to the planet deck, and there is a new action called Mine Asteroid that lets you claim an asteroid instantly by discarding your entire hand. Now, tied into the asteroids are a number of the new technology cards that give you something. And what's neat is they give you something for each asteroid you have in play, which is a new mechanic for the game to get a whole bunch of stuff based on it. Finally, there's a new alien symbol, a new alien icon. Excuse me. Sorry, a new alien icon. Many of the new techs and some of the new planets have this alien symbol, which does nothing. Having an alien symbol means nothing unless you have another card that uses it. And those other cards come on planets and technologies. Now, at this point, we've only played once. And the one thing I've been saying about Eminent Domain all along since the first time we talked about Eminent Domain on this show quite a while ago, we were playing a ton of it at the time, is this game has a learning curve. And to really enjoy the game, you need to know the cards, specifically those technology cards. And this is a game that plays better and the more you know the game and the more you play with other people who know the game. This is a system mastery game. It's like, I, I, like I hate comparing this to chess because one's a very abstract game and it's not, but it's that game where you want to play with people at the same level as you and the game just gets better the more those people learn the game. It's always tough when you've got a game when you when when you're when you know a game and you're ready to to dive in and and start playing and 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 when you you know one person or boy everybody is is just struggling with that learn with that learning curve and you're already there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, what I will say at this point, again, only one play is I I liked what I saw of the new elements. Um, I liked the two stage feel. I liked that. Uh, you have resources that literally do nothing for you until you have the right technology in play. And while there are technologies that are completely useless until you have that right resource in play, whether that be aliens or asteroids, I actually like the, that that feel. It just feels neat. And and something about it felt sci-fi, right? Like I, it just tied in the mechanic that the whole concept just made me feel like, oh, I have alien tech and asteroid mining, and I don't understand the alien tech until I've developed this other thing to use it. Just how, felt very cool and sci-fi to me. Now, Woodlands. This time, um, we played for the next two scenarios. We had played the Little Red Riding Hood before. This Today, we played Robin Hood and the King Arthur quest. Now, for those of you who don't remember me talking about this game before, this is a Ravensburger family weight game. I would possibly kid weight, possibly kids game. Adults are, I definitely enjoyed it. So it's, it's family weight um, where it's designed around transparent overlays. There's a transparent overlay in the center of the table. 
you read out the story and your current quest and the mission, and then you're going to take tiles and you're going to build a three by three grid of tiles using nine tiles. That's going to make a series of paths um, and forests. And the goal is that you would then put your the overlay over your grid and see how you scored the most points based on what's on the overlay. It's it's really unique and so far quite fun. I, I've enjoyed my plays of it so far. Now, I was pleased to see many new things in these new stories because uh, the Red Riding Hood was pretty basic. It was the easiest of them. Uh, there were some really neat ways to use the fact that tiles are a combination of dirt paths and forest areas. Like in the Robin Hood story, there was one mission with guards and you couldn't pass in their field of vision. So you had to strategically place the forests so the guards couldn't see you as you walked past, which was really neat. And then the final part had Robin. Instead of moving on the pass, he had to move through the forest and he had to go get an arrow and then take that arrow to find the sheriff and take out the sheriff. At the same time, you had three merry men on the board and you had the sheriff stronghold. You had to try to make them on the pass so that they could get to the stronghold. Now so the Arthur lot, mission- There's a whole lot going on there. This is way yeah. more complex than just finding your way through the- from, from, Through from the point path, A to point yes. B without crossing anything you're not uh, incorrect. Yeah, exactly. Like, like the, the first one was basically get point A to point B and don't move over any mushrooms, right? right? Like was the kind of story where this was definitely a lot more involved. Now, the Arthur missions were definitely the hardest, uh, like really hard. Like this, to be honest, was a little bit much for Gigi, my youngest. Um, she finished three out of four rounds with zero points and actually would have gone negative had the rules allowed for it. Like they're much more unforgiving. Uh, a lot of this was due to interesting path building rules with lots of having to have either something in the path or in the forest or making sure things weren't another. So there were one of the things where there were guards and they were carrying torches. Well, if they were in the forest, they'd light the forest on fire. And there are campfires and the campfires are safe on the path. Another one though was that um, there was a hailstorm. Hailstorm in the forest is fine. It doesn't hurt anyone, but hailstorm in the path would be bad. And having to deal with multiples at once was pretty interesting. So, and then the other one was cutting off icons. So it's like, you can't make sure the icon can reach the other icon by using wow. forests and paths. Oh uh, yeah. So they, 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 they really increased. I mean, this is, this yeah. is not a nice linear increase. I mean, this is sort of exponential difficulty boost over those first ones, the way you've described them. Uh, yeah, in a way, but the thing is, you're playing through, um, for uh, Robin Hood, it's five missions. Okay. For King Arthur, it's four. So they ramp up slow enough. Like the, So what happened with the Robin Hood is the first Robin Hood, you just had to meet up with the Merry Men. But there was one thing you had to watch out for, and I don't remember what that was. The second Robin Hood introduced the, um, the campfires that could light the forest on fire, but was still uh, get from A to B, but make sure your campfires don't go in the forest. Then they threw the guards in with torches. So again, it's progressing to the, now you got to worry about guards and they can light things on fire. Then it went to the one with the guards with line of sight. So at this point, you knew all the guard rules, you knew the fire rules. Now you got to worry about line of sight. And then there was the funky final one where Robin Hood's in the forest and everyone else was in the past. So like that progression, I think taught it to us, like the, the kids picked it up well enough. But just there was so much going on in the earth. Like there were just so many symbols, so many, right. so many things to look at. Like I had a hard time. I did not win the second game, like even close when we played Arthur. I got destroyed. Part of that is though you can get treasure chests during the game, and some of those you can play against your opponents. And I had to play around upside down, which the <laughs> game's hard enough as it is. Trying to do that mental math in my head did not work. Um, the other thing we did try was the harder backside of the tile. So I don't know how many it is. You play nine. You always have some left. I'm going to guess you have 12 tiles that you get to pick from every round. They're not randomized. Everyone has the same set. Uh, you can flip those over. And on the backs, there are brambles and water. And what the brambles do is they're kind of forest, but they can't be used by things that would travel through forest. So they're literally blocking. Like nothing can go on a bramble. But they're brambles, so they're still flammable. So if you have one of those guards or something with a torch, you lose points for it. Uh, then the interesting one, I, was, I thought this was fascinating for some reason. The lakes do nothing. The, the water literally does nothing. It's just there to mess with your head. So when you're putting the tiles out, you think, oh, I can't go that way because there's a lake. No, it's just literally there to mess with your head. So overall, the biggest thing that I think everyone's going to be worried about with this game is the replayability. And I will say, just swapping to the backside of the tiles really does open up a whole new level of play. So just by doing that, you're going to take 
the four scenarios that are in the game, each which has four or five parts, you're going to double that. Because you can play with the basic side, you can play with the back. You're going to double that. And it feels very different with or without them. Now, we have one more quest to complete, which is the story of Dracula. Um, then we're probably going to go back and play the original ones again with the backs of the tiles. Uh, then there's also that special haunted, haunted forest overlay. And there's a unicorn overlay that can be used and added to any mission. So, like, to be honest, when I started thinking about this and I started doing the math, I don't think replayability is really going to be that bad. So you got four quests. You do each one with the front and the back of the tiles. You're at eight plays. That's pretty good for games. Kids tend to play them more than that. But then you do each of those again with the unicorn. Now you're up to 16 plays. You do it again with the haunted forest. You're up to 24 plays. And that's experiencing every possibility once without ever replaying one. And I got to say, I did so bad in that Arthur mission, I want to play it again. So you're going to get like 24 completely unique plays out of this game, as well as wanting to replay some of them. I'll admit, I don't have a lot of desire to go back and play Red Riding Hood with the base tiles again, but I don't know, 24 plays for a game is not terrible. So I don't know, like uh, we're going to play it some more. Maybe I'll get sick of it. That We're still only at what, four plays total at this point. So there'll be a final review coming at some point, but my fears of this, like you play four times, you're done is definitely not valid. So now, even if it was four and done, it's not an expensive game. I don't believe. I don't know what the SRP so. is on it. Uh, so even if you were to get, you know, the four, four, uh, five. Well, it's five, five scenarios total, right? Or is it just the four? Four. No, it's four. Four scenarios. So four scenarios total. Each scenario having a number of rounds in yeah, within the scenario, five. and then you can flip it over and do it again. So you've got a minimum of ten times the number of uh, internal uh, yeah. rounds. That works out to a pretty reasonable price. I mean, unless they're charging seventy dollars for this, which I don't think they are, think so. um, <laughs> then there's uh, there's there's value there. Fifty dollars in Canada, so yeah, there you go. There you go. I mean, that's absolutely worth it uh, for a game that I think it sounds like it's challenging for a a wide range age range of kids and oh, I adults. Agree. Yeah, like there there's having now played more stories. I'm like, there's a lot more going on, a lot more to think about. Yeah. And as like I said, Grace was, oh man, she just was nailing it. Like the only time she did bad was because I played a card on her that made her play with her left hand instead of her right. <laughs> like other than that, she was kicking my butt. I'm like, I'd look over at her map and I'm like, how did you manage? Like I was literally sitting there and one of them going, okay, there's no way to get all of them. There was a thing you had to do. It was, you had to, you had to make sure the guards were in the forest, not on the path and catch you. And I'm like, I don't think you can do it. I think you got to let one guard go. I, I don't think it's possible. And sure enough, Grace did it, no problem. She got all the points, and I'm like, I tried. Like, I was looking at my tiles going. There's some other stuff, too. Like, this is stuff I didn't mention. Because of the randomness of those treasure cards, there are some special tiles that you can add to players' hands that, again, would add to the replayability. So part of the game is I got to add a treasure tile to my hand. Now, this is mostly forest, so that could be terrible. But it has a treasure chest on it, which you need a key to unlock to get a card. And then it has an open treasure chest. If you can get to the open treasure chest, you get two points. But it's this rather difficult to use card, though that would have been an awesome card to have in the one particular adventure where Robin Hood was hiding in the forest. That would have been a great card to throw into that particular one. So even tossing those in, like that came up randomly because I opened a chest in round two. In round three, I now have a new tile. Stuff like that's also going to add to the replayability. So yeah, the different groups and how they how they interact and play and 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 you know, not not hate crafting, but uh, you know playing. Well, yeah, yeah, basically, can 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 definitely affect the gameplay again, which again just adds to the replayability. Yeah, this is one I I wouldn't mind breaking out when you were done, just because it's so different. Like yeah, the, no, the it's, just it's so unique. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, I know I've mentioned it, what, three or four weeks in a row now about unboxings. I got to admit, this this past week, um, I had a colitis flare-up. I have not been feeling 100%. Um, actually, feeling quite better now, but I, on the weekend, I was rough. And I was not feeling like, up to recording anything. Like, Sean's telling me I'm not allowed to do five in a row. I don't know if I would have got through one if I had enough energy for that. Got a lot of Netflix watching in um, the, the, the f new season of... Uh, the Medici was pretty good. Uh, I binge watched that. Um, so yeah, I, I need to get some unboxings done. Part of that is I've got some cool new stuff from Bicycle, 
which I am looking forward to getting to. So Bicycle Games, like Bicycle, the, the company that makes playing cards, is now getting into hobby board games. They're calling them light strategy games. I've got two of those that I'm going to be taking a look at. Those were just announced yesterday. I've had these for a little while. I wasn't allowed to talk about them. So I'm looking forward to that. And I've got that massive Eclipse box, which I still don't know how well I'm going to be able to unbox here on this table. But I'm going to try. We'll see if it works out. So i got to get these unboxings done. I have a feeling I should be able to get to it this coming weekend. Um, I don't know when, maybe even tomorrow, maybe Friday. We'll see. Well, we got, it's we a little got, hard with the kids home. So I got, I get two more, we got two more weeks of, 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 of wiggle room. So there you go. hall of heroes and uh, Lord of the Ring journeys are, are still in our queue. All right. So we get, we, we, we're not going to run out of nope, content. Not, this is stuff I, I, I owe people unboxings of. Well, I don't know them. They didn't ask for an unboxing, but I like to unbox the stuff people send. This is new pile of obligation stuff. Even, even in, uh, quarantine i'm still reaching out to publishers i got stuff coming too that hasn't shown up yet i got some awesome looking stuff coming the latest valeria game we're gonna get to see that here because they're smart and didn't tell me don't buzz for your game so that's the one mistake <laughs> bicycles the bicycle has made two mistakes so far for one here's a little insider info they don't have a link on the web to their press release they just sent it out by email so I was going to try to push that I'm going to unbox these by sending people to their press release, and I can't because it doesn't exist on the web except for a couple other blogs who have just shared it verbatim. But I'm like, I guess I could send you to a blog, but I want to send you to bicycle.com. Nope, not there. There's no press release there. You can see the two games, and it says coming soon. Um, second, they wouldn't let me talk about it. Don't do this, people. This is dumb. No one's going to steal your idea. You have published games. Like we're, We are content creators. We help you generate buzz i would have been talking about these games for three weeks now i would have been talking about the day i got the email because i was just like bicycle bicycle is going to start making games that's kind of cool they guys have a like a I'm, I'm guessing good production quality right like they've got some money to put behind this i would have to assume being the biggest name in cards what's really weird is one of the games looks like it might not even have any cards so <laughs> we'll see but yeah bicycle listen up don't don't do that like it's there's no point they tried it with raxon and that game bombed like that's a big hobby game that they released they're like everyone will talk about it on the same day no one cares about raxon anymore <laughs> let people build buzz organically yeah. anyway so yeah <laughs> off topic for some reason i'm <laughs> out there today it's because it's uh, it's marjoon um the other thing is Shadowrun six world box set that's something i realized is in the pile of obligation that i can review while we're in quarantine, because I was never really planning on getting it played anyway. Like, it'd be nice, but you guys all know on the podcast how often I get my RPG group together, and that's really going to happen now? Come on. So all I plan to give them is a read review, so I am going to sit there and read through the Shadow World 6 World box set. Um, I don't know how much is in there, to be honest. I remember doing an unboxing video, and I remember being impressed that it was significantly more content than the 5th edition box set. Well, the if you go to the YouTube Del Tabletop Bellhop channel, you can yeah. see the unboxing for yeah you can see just how much if i remember though like there's like it might take me more than a week to read all the books is what i'm saying right i can't remember how much content is in there and then i will do a detailed like chapter by chapter break down all the books review just like any of my other rpg reviews and then if i can get that done by next week i'm gonna maybe aim for an rpg content topic next week as well we did mention some rpgs today but like an actual rpg topic and we, uh, I have just uh, set up a games of Clans of Caledonia on BGA for us to, <laughs> there you go. For us to all join in. So uh, hopefully I'll have something to say about that next week that has nothing to do with Terra Mystica. Or maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah, maybe you'll play <laughs> it and be like, this feels exactly this like, Terra Mystica. like Terra Mystica. What the Mystica. hell are you talking about? <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> like I said, I think my main problem, we're back on that topic, is, is my frustration at people throwing it in. Like yeah. just that, no, that's absolutely. the biggest one. And I get that. And I wasn't trying to do that. I was definitely, yeah. I, I it, it, to me, it's just a way of sort of giving it a, a push in a direction because of some similarities that happen to be yeah. 5,000 or 10,000 or a hundred thousand games out there. It's Terra uh, Mystica, but with gods and economics and economics and no gods, and no fantasy. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Danielle Thomas. Thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly. Thank you, Sean. One of these Mondays, I'll actually remember it's Monday and you're recording, and I'll show up and watch you live again. I apologize for forgetting every dang week. I've been hanging out. I had a good one this week on okay, cool. uh, some... Uh, so, hey, I had a guest on the show this week, even. Uh, Andrew Dacey. 
Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering at twitch.com slash misdirectedmark, but show up on time or you will miss their cold open because of the ad. <laughs> yes. See, they should be running ads before everyone shows yeah. up. Well, that was the double bell. Ah, that means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop at our Patreon, patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.